So we are ready to, to start. The topic is addressing inequalities in a changing world, new models, new tools. We now follow with Dina Freeman. I'm happy to introduce her. She's Senior Visiting Fellow, Department of Anthropology at London School of Economics and now Visiting Professor in Rome. And she's going to speak about re the regulation of transnational corporations. What role for supranational democracy? Okay, everyone hear me? Good, so good afternoon everyone. Delighted to be here. Thank you, Susanna, for organizing both this session and the conference. So I'm gonna talk about the regulation of transnational corporations. Um, and this is in a, in a session about inequality, economic inequality, and a conference about democracy. So I'm trying to bring all these things together. So in brief, I'm gonna start by asking or talking about why is democracy important? Why do, why do we care about democracy in the first place? Okay. How does democracy link with economic inequality? Then I'm going to talk a little bit about transnational corporations, what they are, and why there's problems around the question of how to regulate them. And then I'm going to outline some history of different attempts to regulate them, because this, there's actually been a sort of 40 or 50 year history of people trying to regulate them through international law and as yet not succeeding. Um, and then we'll discuss why that is and what the implications of all that are. So, why is democracy important? Why do we care? So, and, and why is global democracy important? So I would argue that the reason that we need global democracy is basically the same reason that we need or needed national democracy. And that ultimately that is that democracy helps to level power differences. Okay, and really my presentation is talking a lot about power and interests. Now, if we don't have any law, right, how are decisions made? Basically by the law of the jungle, by might is right, right? Whoever is physically stronger or perhaps has other forms of, of strength, okay? If we have undemocratic law, we essentially have the institutionalization of might is right, okay? Where the state has the monopoly on the means of force, and it's using that monopoly to enforce laws on people that represent the will of the leader or a small group of people around the leader. Okay. And with democratic law, we have everybody in society taking part in the decision making if we have a kind of Athenian Greek style of democracy. And if we have a more contemporary style, we have people electing representatives who take part in, in, in that decision making on their behalf. But one way or another, and to different extents, everybody has a role and a say in that decision making process, and they have the same amount of influence on the process. Essentially, one vote to everyone, whether you're big and strong and powerful can beat someone up, right, or very weak, or whether you're very, very rich or very, very poor, or whatever other indications of power there are, when you have a democratic system, ultimately you have one vote, everyone has the same amount of power. In the idealized version, I accept that there's degrees that this is, happens in practice. So the key thing that I want to sort of have frame the rest of my presentation is that democracy is important because it neutralizes inequalities of power. Okay. And therefore, it leads to decision-making which represent a compromise between different interests and different groups within society. So when we often talk about decision-making, we want to improve decision-making, or we want to improve decision-making at the global level as if it was a technical issue, I want to come and say there's actually no objective measure of a better decision or a worse decision. It's about decisions that balance or don't balance the interests of different groups. Okay, so we need to be very, very aware of that. Now, to give a little bit of historical background on this, and we've heard various speakers um, talk about a lot of the historical background, so I'm just going to run through very, very briefly a little example. But if we think about the development of democracy in Europe, now obviously it started before the 1800s, but if we look, if we start in 1800, in any one European country, approximately 2% of the male population had the vote. Okay? Women for sure didn't have the vote. And those 2%, were, it was based on property rights. Right? You had to have a certain amount of property to get the vote. Essentially, you were the landed gentry. You had lots and lots of property. 
So essentially, the, the, the rules of who had a vote was wealth, putting it, it crudely. And they basically participated in the decision making, and so they made decisions that made life really great for them. Okay, and uh, here in Italy, and in, if we've been living in Rome the last few few years, you see the results of that. You see these huge palazzos and everything, right? Which is what the very small percentage were living in. Everybody else was was living in a in a very different kind of world, right? But that's because it was the rich that were making the laws, so that was great for them. So this was a period of phenomenal economic inequality. Um, I'll show you some graphs in a moment. But then if we think, if we rush through what happened from 1800 through to 1950, where in pretty much every European state, by that point we have universal suffrage, everybody has the vote, all men and all women. Okay. So the 1800s are the period of industrialization, great deal of social and economic change. People were becoming pushed off the land, moving from being farmers to workers in factories. There were many, many changes going along. Workers began to organize, began to sort of try and voice their interests. Okay, and we had unions, and we had strikes, and we had ultimately the formation of a political party to represent labor. We had step by step in most countries the amount of property that you had to own to get the vote coming down. Right? So that gradually we got to the position where everybody had the vote. And then what happened? So then we have democratic societies. Hey, this was when we have the era of welfare states. We have uh, education provided for everybody. We have healthcare provided for everybody. We have a system of welfare. Now, depending on your personal view, you might think, well, actually, it was better when uh, nobles lived in palaces, right? It's not better or worse. But you can see that when we had nobles living in palaces, we had the interests of their interests were, re were represented in the decision making. And when we have all the people voting, we have a compromise. Okay? We didn't have a utopia. We didn't have a, 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 a kind of communist re revolution, which was there in the shadows, in the background, where everything would have been e equalized. But we had a compromise between the different interests in society, which made things much better for most people. Um, and in that time, we had a major decline in economic inequality. Now, these graphs are taken from the work of um, Thomas Piketty, famous uh, French economist you may have heard of. And you can see that th this is in the sort of Anglo-Saxon um, countries, UK, US, Canada, and Australia, starting from 1900 going through to about uh, 2010. And it's an, an indicator of, of income inequality. So you can see in 1900, we had very, very, very high income inequality, and it goes down and down and down and down till around about 1980-ish. Okay, and then, zoop, starts going up again. Right? But that period from 1900 down to 1970, that's the period of increasing democracy, of welfare state, of all the things that I spoke about. Okay? And if we look at some of the other countries, the emerging, so-called emerging countries, so South Africa, Indonesia, Argentina, India, Colombia, and China, we see, broadly speaking, a similar, a similar pattern. Okay? Inequality declining, and something seems to go on in 1980 that changes the, the direction. And if we look at a measure of global inequality, okay, again, starting from 1950, again, through to this 1980 period, it goes up, it goes down, it wobbles around, and then from 1980 something changes, and we have massive, massive, massive increase in economic inequality. So, what happened in the 1980s? Why, why do these graphs look like? How does this link up with our story of democracy and demo increasing democracy, reducing economic inequality? So, as I'm sure you're all well aware, this was the period when basically neoliberal globalization started. Okay? What does that mean? That means this is a time when capital burst free of the state and began to move more freely around the world. It doesn't move freely around the world even today, but it moved a lot more freely around the world. So as capital globalized, lawmaking and decision-making about how to govern the economy and how to regulate capital stayed at the national level. Okay, as we've heard many speakers stay, say in the last two days. So we have this sort of scalar problem of global economy at this level and national policy decision making at the other level. So there's, with no democratic lawmaking at the global level, 
means that we have no mechanism to balance the interests of capital and the interests of labor, of citizens, of everybody else. Okay? So the situation was very, very good for capital. So in that period from 1800 to 1950, we've got, we've got a rebalancing at the national level between labor and capital, if you like, as a shorthand. And then in the 1980s, capital's expanded and sort of got itself out of that balance. And so surely the, the, the issue for us now is to how to rebalance it up at the global level. Now, there's ma you know, many, many things that could be said here, and I'm going to just talk about one element of this, but it's an important element, and that's transnational corporations. Transnational corporations, there were only something like 10,000 of them in the 1970s, and there's now well over 100,000. So massive increase in these transnational corporations. Most international trade today, something like 80% of international trade, is carried out within transnational corporations, meaning it's different bits of transnational corporations trading with each other. Okay? Roughly 80% of, of trade today, international trade. So what actually is a transnational corporation? It's actually phenomenally hard to define what a transnational corporation is, because there's very many different variants and different forms. But the key point, if you like, is that essentially its legal definition and its reality and practice are completely different. Okay? The legal definition is that it's more or less a network of legally separate companies that are somehow interlinked. But each company is a, is a separate company registered in a particular country subject to the laws of that country. Okay? In practice, there's an HQ somewhere and there's an overarching strategy for this whole group or network or whatever we want to call it, which is the transnational corporation. So, so in practice and economically, it is one unit. And legally, it's a lot of little different units. Why does that matter? Well, when it comes to thinking about how do you regulate these kinds of companies, it matters a lot. So what happens in practice is that each separate company is subject to the regulation of the state in which it's based. But the whole entity is actually not subject to regulation anywhere, because we don't have a global jurisdiction for anything. So why does this matter? Well, let's say, say we have company A working in country X, but it transfers all of its income and other assets to a linked company, company B, which, has, which is in a different country. Okay? So it doesn't really have any assets or very little assets in country A where, where it's working. Now let's say it does a crime in country A, right? And it's taken to the court in country A, which is the only court it could be taken to. This court might find the com that, that company guilty and might impose a fine or a penalty on this company. But if all the assets of that company are actually in country B and not in country A, and the court has absolutely no jurisdiction in, com in com country B, there's nothing it can do. Absolutely nothing it can do. Okay? And there are many, many legal cases that that's happened. So the most famous one, we actually, someone alluded to it yesterday, was with Ecuador, the country of Ecuador, and the company Chevron Texaco. And it's very well known that in the, its oil explorations in the Amazon area of Ecuador, Chevron devastated the Amazon with awful uh, environmental pollution, oil spills, sludge in all the rivers, toxic pollutions, many communities have high cancer rates. It's a well-documented and rather ghastly situation. In 1993, a group of Amazonian people from this area tried to take Chevron to court. So where did, where, how do you do that? So they first thought, okay, Chevron is, is an American head, headquartered company, so let's try to, they tried to take the court in New York, because that's... Head, and for s 10 years, I think, there was a legal battle between this group that represented 30,000 people of the Amazon and Chevron in New York. And for 10 years, Chevron argued, this is not the right court to take us to... You can't take us to court here. You need to take us to court in Ecuador, because we're talking about things that happened in Ecuador. Eventually, after 10 years, they won that battle, and the trial shifted to a court in Ecuador. It then carried on for a further seven years, okay? and eventually, the court in Ecuador found them guilty and put a penalty on them for uh, totaling almost $10 billion 
for compensation to the local people, for environmental cleanup of the Amazon, and so on. Chevron didn't have any assets in Ecuador. It had taken them all out a long time ago. End of story. Right? There, there, was, that, there was no there was nowhere, there was no jurisdiction. And, in, and to make matters worse, um, or in, in, Chevron then took Ecuador to court th it, it, through an international court, which I'll come and discuss what that means later on, um, through its bilateral investment treaties, suing Ecuador for various things. So, so, so this is good an example, and it also explains why Ecuador is very active in some things I'll talk about in a moment. <laughs> So it would seem obvious, right? It would seem obvious that we need a global regulatory system in international law to regulate transnational corporations. It would seem sim simple. Obviously, we need that, right? But why don't we have it? <laughs> right, and we don't have it because we have no glo global uh, democratic decision making to balance these interests. So essentially, what the transnational corporations who represent global capital want is what we have, right? To put it very, very um, crudely. Now, there have been historically four attempts to try and create an international regulatory system to regulate transnational corporations, okay? starting from the early 1970s and, and until today. Right? The latest version of this process is ongoing right now in the Human Rights Council in the UN, and it's a current and live process. So the first process started in 19, um, 1974, um, when, let's just cut this a little bit, the, um, the Commission on Transnational Corporations was established by ECOSOC, the UN in New York, with 48 member states, with the idea to look into this business of transnational corporations, what they do, how they work, what, how, do we, how, do, how do we make a legal system to deal with them. This was the 1970s, a long time ago. The world was quite different. In 1976, at its second meeting, the Commission, and essentially the Commission, remember, it means it's states, Okay, it's, it's governments who are, who are deciding this. They established an intergovernmental working group to, on a code of conduct with 48 member states, the idea being that they would come and discuss and create a code of conduct on for transnational corporations. So they started work in 1977, and for the first five years, it actually was making quite good progress. It looked, it looked quite possible. Um, when they presented their first draft to the Commission in 1982, two thirds of the 71 provisions in their draft were already agreed. So it really looked like they'd carry on a few more years and, and they're going to get there. But then, from 1984 onwards, progress stopped. Basically, the northern countries, particularly the US, blocked the process, didn't want to have any more to do with it, and people tried and tried to keep it going throughout the 80s and eventually gave up, and in 1993 the process was terminated and the Commission on Transnational Corporations was abolished. Okay, what happened? Why, why did that happen? So at the start of this process, many countries were actually interested in having a code of conduct for transnational corporations. It was actually there was quite a lot of agreement that we need a code. However, the reasons that the different countries wanted a code were completely different and pulled in completely different ways. So companies from the north Right, from the global north, they wanted some kind of code that would protect their investments overseas. Okay, because this was the time, decades before that, we'd had expropriation and nationalization of assets and so on. They, so they wanted a code of conduct for how host governments should treat investors. Right? So they essentially wanted this code that would somehow regulate the governments of the south generally, the host governments, of how they would treat investors. And furthermore, they wanted their businesses to be protected by international law, not national law, and with an international arbitration system to make sure their businesses were very, very safe. The South, however, the Global South, wanted something quite different. They wanted to protect themselves from the negative impacts of transnational corporations in their countries. So they wanted a code of conduct on how transnational corporations should behave. And they wanted to make sure that these companies would be subject to national laws in their national courts. Right? Because we have essentially two different interests, whether you're the investor or you're the host country. The USSR were also involved, but they didn't have many transnational corporations, and I won't bother talking about them now. It was much more a north-south debate. So eventually it ended in, in deadlock, and particularly, I say, America killed it. 
But the reason they did this was because they got everything they wanted through a different process. So then they didn't have to bother with this one. And that different process was the thing that I alluded to earlier on, was bilateral investment treaties. A bilateral investment treaty is essentially is a treaty, essentially a kind of contract between two countries, a host country and a home country, that, that regulates the, the sort of legal situation between them, regard, regarding the investment of one in, in the other. Now, the first one was made in 1959 between Germany and Pakistan, and they increased slowly and slowly in the 70s, a little bit more in the 80s, and then by the 1990s, we have masses and masses of these bilateral investment treaties. And what they do is they create binding international law that respect the, to protect business through international arbitration and with a law that has supremacy over domestic law. Okay? Now just remember that, because that's what we wanted to have for the, <laughs> for the people against the corporations. But by the 1980s and onwards, the North had found a way to get all of that, international law protecting their businesses, and so they, they didn't need to bother negotiating this code anymore because they'd got what they wanted this other way. And so they pulled out. The South, of course, didn't just give up because they, they spent all these years negotiating and got, uh, basically got nothing. So in the late 90s, this question of how do we regulate transnational corporations popped up again in the UN. And this time the focus was on the behavior of transnational corporations, obviously not on host governments. Um, and it was framed as a human rights issue this time, and it was discussed in the human rights part of the, of the UN, not in ECOSOC. And initially, at this point, it was, it was discussed by experts rather than by states. In 1995, a subcommission of, on human rights um, set up a working group of, of experts to look at transnational corporations and to work towards a code of, co of conduct. And we had five experts that were academics, international law specialists from different regions of the world who came together, spent five, six years working on this, discussed with states, with NGOs, with lawyers, with uh, academics, with businesses, and so on. And they came, up, they came up with a really pretty good draft framework of how you could regulate transnational corporations. Okay? It was, and this was called the norms, the draft norms of, of regulating transnational corporations. It was a very revolutionary document. It basically said that transnational corporations themselves are subject to obligations and have under international law, not just states. And it further suggested that there would be an enforcement mechanism through the United Nations where NGOs and other people would be able to monitor the activities of transnational corporations, report it up to the UN, who would then have some kind of jurisdiction it was never quite clear if it was voluntary, not voluntary, but um, to, to try and bring it about, about change. And the <laughs> clever thing within this is they, they thought the way that they were going to make this law work was that they would get transnational corporations to incorporate adherence to these norms in their contracts with their suppliers and subsidiaries. So it was a way of creating international law through, a, through business contract law. Now, in a way, it's not an identical mirror, but it uh, has similarities with the bilateral investment treaties kind of route, putting it there in business law and making it. You know, it wasn't a perfect document, but as a first, as a draft, to, bring, to build discussion, it was really rather excellent. Um, so what happened? What happened to this norms? We, you know, the, the, the thinking had been there. So what happened? The working group in 2003 presented it to the subcommission of human rights, which is also an expert group, and they approved it. They thought, excellent. The next stage is then they take it up to the, what was then the Commission on Human Rights, now the Human Rights Council, which is the group, the governments. And of course, all hell broke loose, right? The business community went insane, right? The International Chamber of Commerce, the International Organization of Employers, those had all been sort of following this came up with all manner of reasons that this was impossible and bad and you name it, any reason they thought about it. They lobbied hard, the governments, you've got to stop this, you've got to block this, this is, this is terrible. Many of the, of, the, of the governments in the north who had it said their corporations were quite easy to be um, convinced. But actually, all of, most, the vast majority of civil society organisations, human rights NGOs, academics, and indeed some states from the south, thought this was excellent, this is exactly what we need. So, we were, it was a big, big hoo-ha at the time. 
What happened was the lobbying was successful of the businesses. The Commission on Human Rights basically killed the norms, says it has absolutely no legal status, we didn't ask for this, um, it's dead, forget about it. And instead, they nominated um, John Ruggie as the special representative of the Secretary General on the issue of human rights and transnational corporations and other business enterprises to look around at all the different uh, existing uh, things there were and basically write a report to keep everyone kind of quiet that it hasn't stopped completely. John Ruddy, as you may know, was the lead architect of the UN Global Compact, which was a kind of CSR style voluntary thing for companies, so it was kind of clear where his perspective was and why he was chosen. And to cut a, a long story short, he basically came up with um, a voluntary code or a voluntary kind of process now known as the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights and it's very very conventional it's a, based around protect, respect and remedy the idea that states not companies or anyone else have the obligation to protect human rights companies have a responsibility whatever that means to respect whatever that means human rights and victims should have access to, mem to remedy and while Ruggie argues that this formulation overcomes the dichotomy between mandatory and voluntary codes, because he said, well, the states should make laws. You know, they, we should have a, basically a, a good network of, of national states making laws, and this will be good. And then we'll also have voluntary codes of conduct through the companies, and uh, we're great. But, of course, um, it doesn't challenge anything. The idea is that each country would make a national action plan, um, saying how it was going to do this and what laws it was going to make. To date, this, the, the UNGPs were accepted in 2011, so that's seven years ago. We have 20 countries have published national action plans, so that's maybe 10%-ish of the countries in the world. Okay. Very few of them, if any really, include new laws to protect human rights. Right, which was the sort of idea of him saying that he could, that this uh, got over the dichotomy of me. They're all staying in this voluntary, voluntary guidelines and so on and so on. So the fourth attempt of what happened, because obviously a lot of people were not very happy that this wasn't really changing anything, and basically it's not changing anything on the ground, and the graph, you know, hasn't, you don't see any dip in the graph in any of these years. So there were three different groups of people that were getting particularly unhappy about this. First of all were the human rights NGOs, who'd been involved in the process of the norms, involved in the discussions about the UNGPs, had many legal specialists and very s serious suggestions of how you could regulate transnational corporations. Then you had Ecuador that was going through that ghastly legal battle that I was talking about and was becoming very aware of this imbalance of binding law that protected the rights of investors and yet only these soft laws that actually had no um, power in court and no, no appropriate court anyhow to, to protect human rights or the environment or people in any way. And at the same time, you also had a, grasswork network of, a, a grassroots network of social movements, okay, including peasant groups, indigenous groups, women's groups, communities infected, affected by the impacts of transnational corporations, right, like the Amazonian group from the Ecuador that were beginning to come together and discuss things at the World Social Forum, at other meetings, okay? And they were all discussing what are our common problems. And it was amazing how one of the common problems that whether you were a peasant in Africa or some uh, indigenous group in the Amazon that many, many of these groups fa faced was, was the negative impact of transnational corporations on their, on their lives. And so in 2012, this massive kind of interconnected transnational social movement launched the global campaign to dismantle corporate power and end impunity, which basically they would like to do what it says on the tin. And this included a demand for a binding treaty to regulate transnational corporations. So we've got all these different stakeholder groups coming together. They um, basically spoke to Ecuador and also South Africa were interested for other reasons. And in 2014, Ecuador and South Africa called for an intergovernmental process to create a binding treaty to regulate transnational corporations again, okay? And this resolution was passed, and this, this uh, started. In 2014, this massive camp, uh, global campaign, 
and the NGO, the human rights NGOs, got together to form an even bigger transnational alliance called the Treaty Alliance, okay, to push for there to be a treaty. So, 2015, the Internet Governmental Working Group has its first meeting. So we're back to the 70s, okay? We're back to the 70s with an intergovernmental process to discuss how do we regulate transnational corporations. Context is very different now from in the 70s, okay? We've had all these processes and all these experts and all these lawyers, so, so there's a lot of learning from the previous processes. There's also, as I said before, a massive increase in the number of transnational corporations in the world, many more than there were in the 70s. There's also the fact that there's also a growth in transnational headquarters, transnational corporations headquartered in the global south, okay, in the emerging economies in India, China, and, and uh, Russia, and uh, Argentina, and Brazil, and so on. About 30,000 transnational corporations are now headquartered in the south. So, and we've also had this massive growth of NGOs and social movements that are now forming transnational connections, which didn't have in the 70s. So it's a very different context, the debate that's happening now, than it was then. Then, in the 70s, it was largely between home countries and host countries, right? North and South. Now, really, it's between business and civil society. Except not, none of them actually have a vote, right? The states are the ones who are having the vote, but really, the discussion is, the, is between transnational corporations and civil society. Between these corporations that pollute the Amazon and the people that are living in the Amazon that got polluted, and, and so on and so on. And it obviously has a strong left and right issue because your values and where you're going to stand of which, who, where your interests are is very much fitting into a traditional left-right um, pattern that we have at a national level but is now at a global level. Okay? And of course, Ecuador under the government of Korea and now Moreno is a left-wing government. So also what the national left-right is influencing these discussions. Um, the global campaign is calling for something very similar to the norms, uh, a direct obligations on companies and so on. Um, and what's happening in this intergovernmental working group is that many of the northern countries are not even taking part, because there's no obligation, of course, right? It's all UN, it's all voluntary, it's all open. So US, Canada, Japan, many others of the northern countries are just not in the room, not, not interested. The EU and its member states are, but are very anti the process, because what, what have they got to gain from it? Not really anything. Um, the business, the International uh, Chamber of Commerce and other business representatives are there lobbying hard for this process not to go anywhere. And then you have this massive group of civil society and people from the Amazon who are coming into Geneva and making their case that it, that it should go somewhere. So where that's gonna go, I don't know. It's something that I'm following in, as a researcher and that I want to see. Um, in terms of our question about democracy and global democracy, you know, I think we can see that the reason we haven't up till now been able to find any way to regulate transnational corporations is because there's no dem democracy in the process and therefore might is right and they have the power. We now have a process with a huge amount of civil society there and they are trying to democratise it. And many speakers in this conference have, have, have really tried to emphasize how having civil society helps make these, these decisions more democratic. And I would say, yes, it helps. It's a step in the right direction, but it's not nearly enough. It's not the solution. Because it, having civil society there and these social movements gives people a voice, right? They're heard. They all come to Geneva and testify, basically, of what's happened in their, in their territories and their countries. But they don't have a vote. So they're ignorable, okay? The alliance of the, of the social movements and the NGOs are actively, they're aware that democracy is the key issue here and they are trying to democratize the process further as much as possible. And one of the main ways they've been doing it has been trying to get parliamentarians from different countries involved in the process. Because of course the UN only has governments, which means the opposition parties are not part of the process. So, for example, they, they have created now a network of parliamentarians in support of the treaty. And there's 1,000 a, a or 2,000 parliamentarians from different parts of the, around the world who've signed on to this. And the idea being that then these parliamentarians can also raise the issue in the national parliaments, and then there's a sort of some kind of democratic debate in the countries or in the regions. And this is happening, and it's causing embarrassment because, for example... The EU Parliament has passed several resolutions uh, in favour of a binding treaty. 
The position of the European Parliament is in favour of the treaty. The position of the European nego negotiators in the UN is strongly against. Okay? So this, this tactic of bringing parliamentarians and having parliamentary resolutions highlights to people the lack of democracy and how people on what the people want when they have some kind of say is quite different from what the governments are asking for. But it still doesn't actually solve the problem because at the end of the day, those that are sitting there in the UN have the vote and all the others don't. So, okay. yeah, I'm a last sentence. I just want to say that, you know, really the only way I think that we will ever get, uh, we, will, we will be able to pass some sort of global regulation on transnational corporations if we really democratize global decision making. Like, that's really the fundamental only way. And the only way to change that graph is to do that. Thank you.